the vascular surgeon. He was a department chair for a very, very big hospital in Cambridge, right, Doc? Right. Right? Give him a big round of applause, Dr. Hood. Come on, you guys. Oh, you good? Okay. I, I guess I'm wired today. Uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, wanted to, uh, usually I start my talk out with a disclaimer, but there's no disclaimer today. Today there is a profound thank you to George, to uh, Mr. Oda, to Mr. Higa, to Lou, to all the folks that, who have invited me here. I'm truly honored to be here. And most of all, I want to thank all of you in the audience because uh, I've had such a Dynamite, welcome. I'm, I'm really touched. I really am. Anyway, here it goes. Oh, I guess it doesn't. Oh, do I have a flicker? Okay. Here you go. Yes, that one. Forward. Yeah. Okay. You know, as as a doctor of medicine, uh, I am a surgeon, and we're a little different. We, we don't prescribe pills, we, we operate on you and then we heal you and you're gone and you live happily ever after. So we tend to be much more pragmatic and if something works, we embrace it. And this is how I got into the water because it worked for me and I've embraced it. And I've embraced it because this is indeed a game changer, as, he, as George says, and it is indeed the future because of a variety of reasons which I will get into later. But my background is up here. I am not going to belabor the point. I was simply lucky. Uh, I'm an immigrant to this country. I didn't have anything. And uh, I was a good student. And as a result, uh, after I graduated from the University of North Dakota, the dean uh, asked me to apply to Harvard Medical School, and I got in. So uh, the fact is, following that, I did my internship. I got drafted to the Vietnam War and then finished my training and from the day I finished my training I had a job at the Cambridge Hospital and went from there to, uh, you know, from the lowest form of life to the chief of the department. In any case, uh, my, my training was at a time when surgery was, in my opinion, at really the zenith of its development. It absolutely was wonderful to see the first heart valves put in and to see uh, how coronary bypass operations turned from a major production into a you know, one hour affair. But in any case, I've had a great ride as a professional in surgery and uh, vascular surgery. I've always been in active practice. I've always operated. And my great joy in my life has been the ability to teach young doctors to become surgeons. And uh, that's meant more to me than anything else. And, in some respects, it uh, cost me one marriage, but in any way, it was my passion and I make no, mistake, no, no, no excuse for it. But in any case, how did I get into Congan water? Well, it was an unusual thing. I operated on a fellow in Bullhead City, a fixed this aortic aneurysm, and it turns out he was from North Dakota. And at the same time, when I was in school, he was in school at the University of North Dakota didn't know each other, but so we had sort of a bond, and uh, I require the patients that have stent grafts to stick around for a week. Uh, they go home the next day nowadays after aortic surgery. And so he lived in Las Vegas. I said, stay, with, stay at my house. And he brings this machine and uh, gives me the water. Well, I will tell you, I've told you yesterday, Germans don't drink water. I'm sorry, but... Uh, we don't. Uh, we have other liquids that we enjoy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 first of all, the taste of the chlorine. I, I, I can pick that up. Uh, I have very good taste buds because I fancy myself to be a pretty good connoisseur of wine and stuff, so you've got to have the right kind of taste buds. And uh, so I didn't drink water. And I drank this stuff, and I drank a liter. And I said, my goodness, uh, you know, it went right into me. And I really, I liked it. Now, uh, I bought a machine two days later, and the rest sort of is history. Uh, and uh, because of that, I got interested in the product, I got interested in why it works. And the explanations that I read 
in conjunction with you know the brochures and what have you didn't totally satisfy me. So what I did was a literature search. I did some of the NIH literature search engines and then I got all these Japanese publications and then of course you go on Google and the first thing it says Kangen water is a scam. You know, it's a scam. It's no damn good and uh, you're a snake oil salesman if you believe in it and so on. And uh, I always have the feeling when there are people that are vehemently against something, uh, they're probably against it for you know, reasons that are not entirely genuine. Having said that, oh, I always do this. Having said that, I developed my own way of thinking about the water and I made an effort, successfully I think, to connect that to hard science reproducible, solid peer-reviewed journal publications that say why it works and uh, how it works and also uh, finding out in the same process that this is now an ongoing subject of research in the allopathic Western medicine community. The water, ionized water, not specifically Kanga necessarily, but ionized alkaline water is now a huge subject of research being done and by next year you're going to have many publications that will validate uh, what I'm saying. Now we always talk about Otto Heinrich Warburg. Uh, it turns out I've become extremely fond of this man because of his incredible uh, versatility. At one time he was a chief of marine biology in uh, Italy. You know he had a career as a cavalry officer uh, he, uh, you know, was an incredible swordsman and an incredible uh, writer, and uh, it was a lifetime friend of Albert Einstein's who dissuaded him from staying in the cavalry and getting out before World War I was over and going back to the laboratory, because that's where obviously he made a good contribution unlike almost anyone. He got one Nobel Prize, he actually got two, but uh, the, uh, the Nazis would not let him leave to go to Sweden, so he couldn't accept it. In any case, he proposed this concept of alkalinity being a favorable state for cellular metabolism as opposed to acidity, which is generated by cancer cells and allows them to live in an environment that uh, the normal body fluids, etc., cannot get to, and that's how they proliferate and ultimately invade our body. Now, there's much more to that, and there's a difference, different talk that I have specifically relating to cancer, but suffice it to say, this concept of alkalinity took root as being a good thing. Now, subsequently, uh, we find out that alkaline water has beneficial effects on the outside of our body. And I consider the gastrointestinal tract to be outside of the body, right? It's a hose that goes from here to you know where, and uh, it is really outside of the body. But we pass things through there that we absorb, that produce, produce energy, that produce minerals, whatever, that enter our stream to replace our mitochondrial and cellular metabolism. And alkalinity neutralizes a lot of toxins within the GI tract, and that's a good thing. But most importantly, the alkaline state can help to buffer the pH in the cell. And I, this is huge because this has not been proven before. And the research done now on animal models, which are made profoundly acidotic. Now, when I say profoundly acidotic, that's from a pH of 7.4 to 7.2. That's profoundly acidotic because seven, you're dead. So that's uh, the narrow range. But the bone is the big buffer for our pH in the cells. Now we find out that when people are profoundly acidosis, like in chronic renal failure, in this case, they tied off the ureters of the animals, so made them acidotic. And all the uh, researchers gave them was alkaline ionized water, either by mouth through the GI tract or injected intraperitoneally uh, as, as like in peritoneal dialysis. 
and the acidosis was corrected in minutes, much more quickly than it would be in the standard way, which is sodium bicarbonate and all kinds of injections. And this is published in the Journal of Therapy, Aphoresis and Dialysis, June 2009. You can just get it online, you just uh, uh, Google, uh, actually, uh, just type in www.pubmed and you can get that article, article downloaded in the form of an abstract for nothing. Now, Warburg showed one thing, and that is that cancer cells, uh, what have I done now? Uh-oh. <laughs> ah, I'm back. Cancer cells, tumor cells, have a block in the utilization of oxygen. And as such, they ferment the uh, glucose and produce very, very little energy. Right here, ATP, very little. Oxidative phosphorylation produces huge amounts of energy. And this factor, M2PK and tumor M2PK, are co enzymes and enzymes that promote the reaction. Now, Warburg had something. He knew about this factor. It was not until a year and a half ago that this factor was elucidated fully and at, at my alma mater at Harvard University. And what this means that we now have an additional tool in which to get cancer-fighting drugs made. And that's thanks to Otto. So his contribution lives. Now, the next second noble truth I refer to is microclustering, because the concept has been widely touted, but the proof has really never been there, including in Japan. Nobody's ever been able to say that this is absolutely real. Well, the answer is it is, and I will tell you why. If you take the surface tension of normal water, uh, little bugs and crawly things can walk on it. When you look at a full glass of water, you can fill it to the point of being overfull. There's what is called a meniscus. You can see that. When you do the same with 9.5 pH Kangen water, you will have no meniscus and that bug will drown because the surface tension is so much lower. Now, that's no proof, but that is an inference that the molecular structure is different, right? So now, the next thing that you can do, particularly uh, analyzing with nuclear magnetic resonance, you can extrapolate the size of molecules by the bandwidth that's reflected and uh, measured in hertz in a nuclear magnetic resonance test. And it is found that uh, in nature, in normal water, from a stream, from a tap, or what have you, there's a huge variation in, in bandwidth in the molecule size, anywhere from two, that's called dimers, to 128 or more. When you do the NMR, tap water resonates at 130 hertz. Micro water, alkaline water, at 65. Clearly indicating a much smaller molecular structure. Now, water gets into your body in a passive way. Almost all other things, sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, they have pump mechanisms, they're enzymatic mechanisms that actually have an active transport. Water has to flow into your cells. And in 2003, uh, McKinnon and Agri discovered a gene, which is an RNA coil, that goes through the cell wall into the cell. It's fixed and it's called an aquaporin. They received the Nobel Prize for that. And uh, it is probably linked to some of the problems that we have with type 1 diabetes. And it looks something like that. This is uh, Peter Agre's uh, certificate from the King of Sweden, a Nobel Prize. And this is the little uh, concept that they put on this, which is your cell membrane and the opening, the aquaporin, and the water molecules going through. Here's another description of that uh, cartoon, I guess you call it. And you have the large aggregates and the small aggregates, and you can clearly see 
why this aquaporin and why the microclustering is of benefit. It's like throwing a golf ball versus a tennis ball at a chain link fence. Did you see type 1 diabetes, not type 2? Type 1 diabetes. Type 1, yeah. Uh, type 2 is a different disease. Uh, in any case, the third noble truth I refer to is the antioxidant properties. Basically, antioxidants are molecules that prevent oxidation. They will be able to give up an electron to a electron deprived atom to stabilize it. Free radicals are the things that do damage to our cellular structure. Everything in our uh, cellular lining is negatively charged normally. The red cells are negatively charged, as is the lining of your blood vessels. If they weren't, you would have clumping and attraction, and you wouldn't get blood flow, you'd get blood clotting. Uh, antioxidants remove free radicals. That is established in the literature for 25, 30 years. And uh, the, we have examples of you know, vitamin C, uh, fruits, vegetables, and so on, that are great antioxidants, and therefore nutritionists encourage you to eat those kind of foods. But nothing compares with the reduction of uh, oxidation potential of Kangen water. It is dramatically higher. And it is measured in millivolts, and we've all seen uh, the chart, and I guess I'm going to have it here. But first, a normal oxygen atom is stable. When it becomes positively charged, it sets up a chain reaction which da damages cells. And the cellular damage, when it occurs right here, needs to be repaired. And it's the repair process that causes a lot of issues and disease. The most important one of which is in arteries. You have an artery that's been injured by free radicals. As a result, if there aren't enough antioxidants and so on to neutralize them, once the injury occurs, there's a need for repair. This is your red blood cells, this is the basement membrane, this is the disruption. Platelets come in and uh, plug the hole so that there is no further erosion. And then macrophages and other scavenger cells come in. But the byproduct of the repair is fatty deposits in your artery. And once you have one of those, you have a propensity to get more because once you have an elevation in the flow surface, you have shear stresses. And shear stresses can cause further injury. And the next thing you know, uh, this artery can occlude, and that's what you have. You have claudication in your legs, or you have a heart attack, and depending upon which it is, uh, the, it will determine the severity of the heart attack. If it's in your left main coronary, they call that the widow maker. Most people die from a heart attack like that. If it's in the left anterior descending, you've got a 75% of chance of survival. ORP, here it is. Look at Kangen water. I have measured my own for my own machine. I get up to 600. And this is, of course, green tea and your fruit. And so the impact of the anti antioxidant uh, properties is absolutely profound. And it leads us to the next issue, which is huge. Cancer is a huge health problem uh, in our country. I mean, uh, let's, let's be clear, the commonest cause of death in the United States and all of Western Europe is heart disease, uh, but next door is cancer. And uh, cancer treatments were always uh, based on the fact that you should not take antioxidants just in case that might uh, uh, you know, affect the drugs. Well, it turns out that in science daily, in Science Daily, in 07, 850 articles were reviewed where patients were taking chemo radiation, different types of modalities of chemotherapy, and, as a, uh, and were taking antioxidants. And the idea was to determine whether or not there was a harmful effect 
from what the practice actually was. Is that real harm by taking antioxidants? And the answer kind of was no. Antioxidants can be taken without ill effects when you're on chemo and radiation. And that's the problem difference because it tends to make people feel better. Also, recent evidence, specifically in ovarian cancer, suggests strongly that if people are on high-dose antioxidants, there is a bias towards better results on the antioxidant side. So this is ammunition that you have at your disposal because you might call on some MD and use a whole period of your gastric antioxidants with chemotherapy, blah, blah, blah. The answer is wrong. You can't. And it's proven. It's incontrovertible. It's scientific data, hard work. And that's a good thing for you to know. Now, there's a couple of things I want to quickly run through. I call them medical conditions requiring good restrictions. I don't know what the newer brochures are like in the, when you get your machine in the box, but the one I got was sort of semi-unreadable, uh, but it said, if you have trouble with the kidney, don't drink the water. Well, uh, that's not entirely correct, because the water really has nothing to do with the kidney. The issue with kidney disease, congestive heart failure and chronic obstructive lung disease, is that they frequently require fluid restriction. Because if the body is overloaded with fluid, the lungs can't pump out the fluid into the left heart, and you get extreme, uh, what is called pulmonary edema, and it can kill you. So, some diseases you need to know about require fluid restriction. So, if their prospect wants to buy a machine that helps with chronic renal failure, uh, it doesn't mean you can't buy the machine. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, the water is contraindicated. It means he has to follow the regimen of how much he can drink or she. So, anyway, coronary artery disease, the heart failure. We have a measurement to do it by ultrasound. It's called the ejection fraction. When you're normal, it's 65% plus or minus 2. When it's really, really bad, it's 12 or 13 percent. And the workload of the heart is increased the more fluid you drink, the more fluid it has to pump. Those people need fluid restriction. Okay? And it's variable depending upon the degree, but if they've ever had an episode of pulmonary edema, you have to be very comfortable. That is just uh, a uh, rundown of a chart that essentially tells you that when you have chronic heart failure, the body's only mechanism, in a way, and it works against it because it uh, shuts down uh, uh, excretion of urine through the angiotensin system. So you've got to be careful. These people need to be on diuretics and so on. It's not important to know all the steps. It's important to know that there is a limit of the amount of liquids people could drink, water or anything, because of the increase in workload of the heart. And basically, uh, this is just a depiction that shows you that an open heart has thick, healthy muscle. A sick heart is stretched out and thin muscle, and therefore cannot squeeze out as much of a uh, pulse, as a volume, or a systolic uh, volume, as a normal heart. Now, the same thing is true of obstructive lung disease, except that affects the right heart, uh, and the right heart is a low pressure system. Your pulmonary circulation and blood pressure is 40 as opposed to 120 on the uh, uh, bacterial side. And so when the lungs get diseased, and of course in our surface, uh, surface uh, civilization uh, here, it's cigarettes that cause most of the damage. There's increased resistance to flow because of scarring. And then the pulmonary artery pressure rises, we call that pulmonary hypertension. And it gets to a certain point that the heart really can't keep up with the pulmonary edema results again. And uh, the people who are in failure and they can die. And therefore, fluid restriction may well be necessary as part of the therapy for this condition. This is just the same kind of, uh, you know, cartoon telling you what causes it all cigarette smoke, occupational things, dust, and so on. And, uh, some diseases, particularly some fungal diseases. 
And then finally, we have renal failure. That's, that's, I get the most questions from, from uh, an agile compliance about renal failure. There's two kinds, high output and low output renal failure. There are people whose uh, body cannot be cleared of all the poisons, but they still make a huge amount of urine, but it's extremely diluted. The concentrated ability is gone. Now, those people are lucky because they get pretty much drink as much water as they want. Uh, but uh, that's rare. The commonest cause is oliguric renal failure, uh, and the output of that kidney is fixed uh, for anywhere from you know 1,000 cc's to 300 cc's. And based on that, you need to consult with the nephrologist or with the physician as to how much this individual can drink a day. And they're very strict about that because they weigh people before dialysis and after dialysis and so on. But again, it isn't an absolute contraindication. It is a relative contraindication as far as caution is concerned. We divide renal failure in three segments, and that is pre-renal from the blood flow. Uh, there's not enough blood flow to the kidneys. It can't work efficiently. It can't filter efficiently. And then we have intrarenal glomerulonephritis, tyronephritis, obstructive diseases of the kidney. And then post renal, which are obstructing the outflow either at the ureteral level or even at the bladder level. There are people with long, long standing prostatic hypertrophy who go to renal failure because uh, they, they, their, their system is always under pressure and it dilates and eventually fails. <coughs> now, in end stage renal disease, the glomerular filtration rate is so low <coughs> that you basically poison your own body and then dialysis or transplant may be appropriate. This is sort of what the uh, end stage kidney looks like, it kind of is nasty. I have a few recommendations. Uh, uh, feel free to ask me any other questions, but I wanted to make sure that because of what I've learned in answering questions from distributors, patients, or whatever, that the, the single most important thing to me is Make sure you know what is the expectation of your client, of your prospect. Because if they want to be saved, like they're going to Lourdes and be restored to normal health, <coughs> it's not going to happen. And then they will be angry. They'll have buyer's remorse, and they'll be upset with you, and you sold me, uh, whatever. And don't give medical advice. And by that, I'm serious. I, it's perfectly okay to <clears throat> cite certain testimonials, it's perfectly okay to say, well, we have had reports that many patients have lost their X amount of their headaches, or their, well, Fred, Fred Brown's hair grew back, right? So, uh, <laughs> it, that's all right to say, but you have to be accurate and make sure that you state that this pertains to an individual, as opposed to being a general policy or a general statement about the water. And don't suggest that it cures it. Cure is a complicated thing. When people say to me, well, I was cured with stage four cancer, I guarantee they do not know what stage four cancer is. And the, the things that I've seen where I've actually got a pathology report associated with the stage four cancer claim uh, was just not true. It's stage two cancer, which is 85% curable for that particular cancer. There are in 1,200 different cancers that we classify. And so, uh, when you're talking stage four cancer, it's a generic term that is meaningless, unless you know exactly what it is. Now, I like to emphasize the concept of wellness, and that's what Wade does. And Wade says to you, you've got to keep well by preventing your body from getting into trouble in the first place. I mean, I know I don't do that, but I'm working on it. Now, the most important thing, though, is we need to live a healthy lifestyle. You know, uh, 400, uh, 458 before the Christian era, Siddhartha Gautama said, everyone is responsible for their own health and diseases. And by that he meant, you know, treat your body like a temple, and uh, you'll do well. And, uh, you know, good Buddhist advice. Well, finally, 
educate yourself about the product and educate yourself about the competition product. Because you really want to know what you're selling, why you're selling it, why it is better, why it is not, you know, a Yugo, it's a Cadillac that you're selling. You're selling the best. And when in doubt, ask the experts. Uh, I, I, I promise you, I answer my emails and I answer my calls, and I'll be happy to talk to you any, any time. And, uh, I mean, this is redundant, basically, know your competition. And you must be convinced and you must live it that Enagic makes the best machine on this planet, and we must be able to show this to our prospective customers. And finally, make everything in this life as simple as possible.